Good morning. It is good to see each and every one of you here this morning. So thankful to have you in the house of the Lord with us, just to be able to worship together and to be together this morning. A couple of announcements before we get started as I take a deep breath and catch my breath. A um, couple of things. We have, in a couple of Sundays, some exciting things coming up. First is our Fall Fest. It's going to be a little different this year. Normally, we have a lot of games and, and blow-ups and all inflatables and all that kind of stuff uh, for families, and, but this year, we're not going to be doing that, and so you can get some more information about that from checking with Jennifer or the FB, FBC Kids Facebook page. But what we're doing is we are making buckets for families to be able to come and pick up on this Sunday, uh, the 25th. Take back home. It'll be full of candy and games, family devotions. There's a lot of exciting things that we have in that that we want to allow families to be able to do and to celebrate this time of year. But also with everything, not be able to put people at risk uh, coming together. And so we're excited about that. With that in mind... We have, um, uh, I think, over 90 families registered already for this, and so we need some candy to put in those buckets. And so if you have not already brought candy, a bag of Halloween candy uh, to put in these buckets, then we could greatly appreciate you helping us to do that. You can drop those off uh, at the church office at any time that we're open this week or next. Also on that Sunday, we have an exciting event for our students getting together all outside. I don't know what it is about fire, but uh, a lot of students love fire. And so we're going to have a bonfire uh, to be able to allow them to come and just worship together, uh, have a great time together, um, even uh, have some hot dogs and s'mores together. And so this will be here at our main campus. And so students or parents of students or friends of students, or if you see students walking down the side of the road, let them know about this event. It'll be a great opportunity. And then also an exciting thing next Sunday, we're going to be having our Sunday schools open back up. We're going to be doing some things a little different, and some classes are going to be moving around a little bit to accommodate the size of the class, going from small rooms to bigger rooms and those kind of things. And so if you have any question about that, please see Brother Jim over here or contact the church office because there are a few of those Sunday school classes that are going to be moved around into new rooms. And so we're exciting about this, excited about our small groups to be able to get together. And this is adults, also our students and children that will be having Sunday school classes. And so make sure that you, uh, if you feel comfortable, join us for those exciting times. All right, today is an exciting time for us. A couple of things that are going to be going on. For one, we have the opportunity, as you have noticed in your chairs, there is a ballot uh, for our deacon, uh, nomina- deacon ordination. Uh, and so what we want to do is we've recommended from the deacon body to be able to help uh, take this next step in these deacons' lives and ordaining them. Uh, and so what we're going to do is have a special call business meeting. So if you're a guest uh, with us this morning and not a member of First Baptist Church, if you could just allow us to do this and those watching online, we appreciate you being with us, but we need to take care of this business and do it in the right way uh, and allow our church family to be able to do that. And so what we need to do at this time, I'll first of all ask if there's a motion to allow us to go into this special call business meeting. Okay, Chris Menard has made that motion. Do I have a second? Ricky Wingard, second that, appreciate that. Uh, And so um, all those in favor of us entering into a special call business meeting, if you're a church member, just say aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposed? They're usually on. So, all right. Now that we are officially in a time of business, let me just give some instructions. There's a ballot in your chair. Uh, There should be a ballot there. There are going to be some men. I I realize that we have taken all of our pens and stuff out of those chairs, and so we have a few of our deacons. If you need a pencil, Uh, to mark your ballot. If you are a church member, uh, we're going to ask you to take this ballot, mark on there the affirmation of yes or no for these three men. Again, these men are Joshua Merritt, Brian Todd, Eddie Weaver. Uh, The church voted um, for deacon nominations back in March 31st, both in the uh, of 2019 in both of our services. From then, the deacon screening committee interviewed and screened these men, uh, these nominated men, Uh, And then in our regular scheduled business meeting of November 24th of 2019, uh, Josh, Brian, and Eddie were introduced as our church candidates. They have gone from that moment 
all until this moment through a training period, meeting, going through books, reading books, attending deacons meetings, learning about what we do. And so in the deacons meeting of Sunday, September 13th of this year, the deacons voted to recommend to ordain these men. And so what you are doing as a church we are affirming them to be ordained. We will schedule an ordination service for these three men, but we need you as a church to affirm their ordination now that they have gone through the process. And so if you'll do that. Now, if you could, for those church members that have voted, if you will collect all of those ballots on your row uh, and kind of hand those to the edge of the aisle, then we're going to have some men come and collect those Ballots, and we want to be sure and take up all of the ballots if we could at this time. So, um, I've got some deacons helping there, and so once we collect those, if you have some ballots, uh, again, if you'll collect all of those, those that you've used and those that are unmarked, just collect all those off the seats, allow our deacons to take those up. Thank you again, guests. And those watching us online for allowing us to do this church business during this time. If you have ballots, whether they are marked or unmarked, if you'll raise those up so we can collect those before we move out of our time. All right, any other ballots? There's some in the back. Let's make sure we collect those. Chris, some up here at the front. Thank you for that. Chris, right there. There you go. Thank you, sir. All right. Any other that we have? If you have some, raise those up so our men can see those. Okay. Ricky, if you'll get yeah, those from Dan. Thank you. All right. We don't want to take much time, much more time, but that takes care of our business. That was our stated agenda for our special calls business meeting so there's nothing else uh do i have a motion that we adjourn out of this special motion special business i have a i have a motion out there from dan do i have a second uh, brian todd seconded that all those in favor of adjourning say aye, aye. any opposed i could find more business for you all right well we're excited to have you here to worship We've, we've taken c care of a, an incredible step for us as a church to be able to ordain men into our deacon ministry. We're going to celebrate baptism this morning. We're going to celebrate God's work and his hand and his grace that he has given us. And so let's worship together as we are here today. Brother Bob. Amen. Thank you, Brother Paul. Let's all stand today. We celebrate God's love. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the light, you call my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens.
praise Him for His love today, church. Amen. Praise Him. You may be seated this morning. And uh, wow, we have an opportunity to celebrate uh, together in the ordinance of baptism today. And uh, let's begin uh, this time uh, with the baptism video. You watch carefully. said the sinner's prayer, I asked Jesus into my heart. Do you know that you're saved today? Uh, yes. I want the, I want the follow in his footsteps. Amen. Sorry about that. I'm wearing my mask because I'm being close, so a little, a little loud this morning. Hey, we've had a wonderful opportunity uh, just to be able to, to meet this family. I, I met them back during the storm. I went over and did some help um, for them and got to know Christian and Tori and their mom, Tina, uh, and Tina's mom, Patricia, and then Patricia's mom, we know as Lucy Wilson, who attended our church for a number, number of years. In fact, they all kind of grown up in the church. But as I was there being able to help them, we began to talk about their relationship with Jesus and uh what they wanted to do as far as baptism. And we've been talking a number of times. I've been over to their house. Uh, just being able to talk with Christian and Tori. And let me just tell you. Um, this is a big step. Especially for Christian. Uh, coming this morning. And just an incredible step of courage. To be able to come in front of you. But he has a desire to be baptized. And as you've heard from his testimony. Uh, in his words, and we've also talked a number of times that he knows without a doubt that he has Jesus in his heart because he asked him in his heart, knowing that Jesus died on the cross. And we know that this water does not save us. This water, this baptism that we do is just a sign of our associating with what Jesus did in his death, burial, and resurrection. But this is a step of faith. Literally, this is a step of faith for Christian and Tory coming today. Uh, a Christian is nervous, as you can tell. Anybody would be. I get nervous up in front of people. I even get nervous when I preach, Christian. But we want to just celebrate together because this is a great day of what God is doing in their life and in their home. And we're excited about this. So, Christian, upon your public profession of faith as Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go ahead and grab your notes. Buried with him in baptism. Raised to walk in new life. All right. All right, and this is Tori Green, Christian's sister. Um, Scoot up just a little bit. There you go. All right, and again, this is a great step of faith for them, just being able to come. But again, they had a desire. Two years ago, they asked Jesus into their heart because their mom has been talking about Jesus to them for a number of years. And they came to a point of realizing they needed to be baptized and wanted to be baptized. And so, Tori, upon your public profession of faith as Jesus as your Savior... I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in new life. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. What an incredible time. And uh, it just kind of sets up our next song. Our next call is called uh, All My Hope. 
is in Jesus Christ. You worship with us today. going back no I'll never be the same Lord I'm just telling you now one time please somebody today now and know before the Lord today. God, we come before you today, God, rejoicing, God, that there is salvation in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, and that all of our hope is in Jesus, God, and if we've put our hope and our faith and our trust in you, God, you've told us in your words, God, that our sins are forgiven. 
So God, we praise you for that today. We thank you for being our living hope. God, I pray as always that your spirit move in a mighty and an incredible and in a supernatural way, God, here today in our presence. God, as we continue to worship through song, through the preaching of your word, God, that you would have your way, God, here in this place today. God, we thank you for the hope that you've given us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Man, this is an incredible song of hope. You sing these words to the Lord. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name.
to our God. You may be seated this morning. We're going to allow our kids to be dismissed to their gym town and junior gym town. What a wonderful opportunity that they have to be able to go and to hear more about God and his love for each and every one of us and about Jesus and what he has done for you. I want to just acknowledge and appreciate our staff. We have an incredible staff to be able to work together. I just want to say a special thank you to Brandon. Uh, for filling in. I never have any doubt uh, about leaving and wondering who is going to come and share, whether it's Jim or Brandon, and know that Jim and Brandon both have filled in and done a wonderful job. And thank you, Brandon, filling in. Last time, Missy and I had a wonderful opportunity getting, to, getting away and uh, just having a few days to relax together. So appreciate that and am very thankful and excited <clears throat> to be a part of a great team. We're going to continue in today in this road of grace, the study of Romans that we've been on for a number of weeks. We're going to be picking up in Romans chapter 5. And so if you've got your Bible or your app, you may be able to open that up to Romans chapter 5. Uh, we're going to be looking in that <clears throat> uh, today. I want to just go ahead and jump in because there's a lot of things I have to, to say to us, to share with us. Uh, but it's stuff that we have heard before, but sometimes you and I, I know I do, need to be reminded of the great things that God has done for us and why it's so important for us to understand what God has done for us in his grace. Because if we do not understand as God's church, then it's going to be very hard for this world to see any difference in our lives and to understand what Jesus has done for each and every one of us. So it's an amazing thing when we open God's word and rely upon it as truth, when in this world so many things are going wrong, so many things are chaotic, so many things are out of control. And I, to be honest, I've talked to a number of people who have just given up, given up hope, given up their desire to follow God, given up on our government, given up on politics, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but given up. And it's so hard for us to understand and to grasp that God can be in control of this world that we live in and in control of our lives if we allow him. And this is why I'm thankful that you are here and many of us are watching online to be able to understand this. Chapter 5 in Romans says, Therefore, now again, as I've heard a number of times, and I'm going to share with you, when you see the word therefore, you got to go back before to see what they're talking about. Last time we were together, we talked about in chapter 4 of Romans, this idea of being justified by faith and what that really means. Being justified that we are paid and made new by faith, which is something that is not of ourselves that we, <clears throat> God has done for us and we believe in. In fact, if we go back to Romans chapter 4 verse 25, it says that we have been delivered up for, our, that Jesus has been delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Now that's an important thing as we continue on in this study of, of Romans, this idea of justification. What does it mean that you have been justified? What does that really have to do with what we've seen this morning, even in the testimony of baptism, to be able to know that we have been justified? Well, the big question of is justified by faith. This idea of faith, again, is our belief in something that causes us to act upon that. I can believe a lot of things, but if I'm going to have faith in something, that means that I'm going to act upon that belief. Every single one of us sat down, not really doubting whether or not we were going to be able to be upheld by that chair. We had faith because you're sitting down in that chair. So you acted upon that faith and believed that that chair was going to hold you up and that it's a comfortable chair. Unlike those metal chairs. Can you imagine sitting in a metal chair for an hour, hour and a half or however long I preach today? It'd kind of be a little uncomfortable. So we can have faith in the comfort of these Chairs. What do you have faith in? Some of us have faith in football teams. Yesterday, our faith in referees and the knowledge of calls was a little questioned for all of us. 
our faith in being able to withhold our emotion. I had someone in our home, and I'm not going to mention who his name is, but he used to be on staff. But it was an amazing thing to see him because he got a little excited towards the end of the game. Sometimes we have to have faith in the right things. I'm just thankful that the Razorback, watching Razorback football is exciting again. That's a whole other sermon, though. We won't go there. I can, but we're not. We're not. But we're talking about this idea of being justified by faith. And in Romans 5, we see an amazing thing about being justified and what that means. Today, there's two things that I want you to understand. In fact, you're just going to walk away. If you walk away with anything, walk away with these two things. We're going to understand the blessing of justification and what that means for us. And we're also going to look at the basis of our justification and what that means. Out of this chapter that the Apostle Paul gives us, is he's writing to the believers, both Jews and Gentiles, that are in Rome. He longs to go back and to see them because he knows that they are struggling in their belief and faith. So he wants them to understand what this thing about Jesus is all about. And that's the very thing for you and I, is it not, in this world that we live in to fully understand what Jesus has done for us. So let's look at these as we work through this chapter today. Let me begin. I'm going to go ahead and read through the first 11 verses, and then we're going to unpack that a little bit. But I want to give you a big picture of this. So follow with me as I read Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received reconciliation. Now, there's seven blessings of the justification that Paul mentions to us that I want us to look at today. Seven things you think, whoo, we're going to be here for a while. No, just strap your seatbelt on because I'm excited about these things. The first one is peace with God. Since we've been justified by faith in verse one, it says we have peace with God. Now, as a sinner, we are at war with God. I don't know if you've understood that, but when we disobey God, when we sin against God, when we choose to go against God, we become an enemy of God. This te- the, we learn this in, even back in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 48, verse 22, when it says, there is no peace with God for the wicked. There's no peace. No matter how much we may try because of the sin, the disobedience, the choices that we make in our life to go against God, there is no peace. And I don't know about you, but we need a little peace in our lives today. We need a little comfort and peace that comes when we're constantly having to battle against the things. In fact, this morning I was just talking with not only one, but a number of folks who said, if there's anything else that goes on in my life, I don't know if I'm going to be able to handle it. We need peace, but God's word says there is no peace as long as there is sin. But Paul says, because we have been justified by faith, our faith in Jesus We now have peace with God. You see, what happens is through condemnation, God declares us enemies because God cannot be in the presence of sin and disobedience. You and I have got to understand the sin 
And we've talked about that earlier in Romans. In Romans chapter 3, even how it talks about that who is righteous. There's no one based on what we do because of the sin that comes into our hearts. But we have peace. You see, condemnation, God declares us enemies. Through justification, God declares us righteous. God declares us righteous. So we have peace. Second thing that we have through our justification is access, as it talks about in verse 2. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace, this grace that is the gift of God that is given to us. We have access. What does it mean to have access? It means you've been given the keys to be able to go into the home. It means that we now have this, uh, you know, a funny thing that happened while we were on vacation. Um, We got to the cabin and I realized there's no key to the cabin. You just have an access to punch in the number to get into the house. Well, I didn't have that code. It was supposed to be emailed, but it never, for some reason, never was. And so luckily I had the phone number. So I called and said, we need in our cabin. I need access to the cabin. And so they gave me the code over the phone. They said it was a new system that they were in, and sometimes it kicks out the email for the code because it's a special kind of email. And I was like, okay, well, as long as we have access to the cabin, I'm happy. So we got access. We were able to enter into this beautiful cabin that we were able to have for a couple of days. But a lot of times when we really need access, we think, gosh, how can I get into that? How can you really get into the presence of God? Knowing that we have this sin and we're constantly choosing, we're constantly being tempted to do things in our life that are disobedient to God. How can we expect to have access? Well, Paul says it's through the justification that Jesus did that we therefore have access. We're reminded of this even in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 and 20. It says, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus... By the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain. That is through his flesh. When Jesus died on the cross, you remember the story, the curtain in the Holy of Holies that separated the holiest of places that only the chosen priest could enter. That curtain was torn. So the access point was opened up. Just like when Jesus died on the cross for our sins and he justified us, we now have access to be able to be in the presence of God. Third thing that we see in this text is there's a glorious hope also in verse 2. Not only do we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, we rejoice in hope. Rejoice. Rejoice is an amazing thing. It's almost like if you take the word rejoice and we break that down, it almost means like that we're able to boast. So when we rejoice about things, we're boasting about things. And that's a good thing. Not in an arrogant way, but we rejoice. There's so much within us that we just want to say, ha ha, Satan, look here. You know, even though we were robbed of the win yesterday, I rejoiced in the way that the Razorbacks played because I'm like, goodness gracious, they're going into Auburn's hometown. We're not talking about football, so I'm not. But anyway, it was a good thing. And I rejoiced because I, bo- I heard that amen out there. We boast about those things. Well, Paul says we are able to boast, not about what we're able to do, but the hope that we have now been given. You see, when sin and disobedience and the choices that we fall into and the temptation and the work of Satan to destroy us in our lives, there's not a whole lot of hope. Now, see that in our lives every single day. All of us are dealing with so much in our life that it's hard for us to have hope. But what we have to remember and what Paul reminds us in this text is that through the justification and what Jesus did for us, we now have hope. We can rejoice. And this is something that we are able to experience because earlier in chapter 3, verse 23, it says, but all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But what Paul is telling us is because of what Jesus has done for us, we now have hope. We haven't fallen short. We can boast about this glory that God has given us in being reconciled. So not only do we have peace or access or hope, but we're also given this idea of a Christian character. So the fourth blessing that we see in this in our justification is the Christian character we see in verses 3 and 4. Through this 
suffering. Now, I know it's hard for us to understand how are we supposed to be happy about suffering? Who really enjoys suffering? I see no hands. I hear the crickets. No one likes to suffer. I've never met a person in all the years of my ministry experience where people really are excited about when they suffer. Woohoo! Something else has happened, just like this morning. Woohoo! I'm excited that things are going wrong in my life. This is just incredible. We don't. So, what is Paul talking about when he says we need to rejoice, boast about our suffering? None of us run to school and say, hey, let me tell you how horrible and crummy my weekend was. None of us do that. When we come home from work, some of us, now some of you may argue about your teachers, but that's something different. Okay? Some of us even can come home and argue and complain. We can, we're good at complaining. But none of us really like to boast about our suffering. Well, Paul says, this is what we're talking about. Because suffering does something to us. When we go through suffering and hard times, it's something in us that helps us to make it through. And this is what Paul's talking about, the suffering. Now, imagine what it was like if Jesus never died on the cross. If Jesus never came to this earth. If he just decided to stay in heaven and say, oh, well, let them figure it out. What kind of life would we have? But no, Paul is saying that through the justification that we have through Jesus, therefore, we can have hope that even in suffering, good is going to come. Because Paul says, listen, in your suffering, know that through your suffering, It produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. You see, there's a process of growth that happens that allows us to be able to grow in these times of tribulation. The word tribulation, if we look at that, it's basically derived from the word tribulum, which is a tool used to separate the grain from the chaff. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but basically a tribulum is this wooden piece of wood that has either metal or stone um, um, teeth, basically, and as they, they would comb it through the grain, it would get all of the grain out, leave the chafe, and then the chafe would blow away in the wind. It's the idea of separating the good from the bad, the useful and the unuseful. So the idea is, as suffering happens, it's, as we call sometimes, it's going to help r- get away the rough edges. It, it's gonna, sometimes I've told people, sometimes God works on me like a feather and just kind of gets the dust out of the way. But sometimes, most of the time, God is working on me with a hammer and chisel trying to get the rough edges away. And the idea is that Paul gives us is when we go through this suffering, it's for a reason. To allow us to be able to experience this grace that we find through justification. This grace That God has given us as his gift. James tells it this way in chapter 1 verse 3. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Faith is a process of growth. If you are not stepping in faith in Jesus Christ. You are not growing in your understanding of Jesus. You're choosing not to have faith. When we say oh I can work this out. When we say, I don't need God for this. When we say, I'm just going to make my choice the way that I want to. What we're doing is we're not going through this process of growing in our faith. It's the same thing that Paul tells us in this text. That we can experience growth through our suffering to establish Christian character. The fifth thing that we look at is God's love. As we continue to move through this passage in verse 5. Of chapter 5, he says, And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out. Hope is being able to have confidence. If I have hope in something, then I have confidence that it's going to happen. If I have hope in someone, then I have confidence in that person. If I have hope in God, that means I have confidence in God that He will be God, even though this world may be going crazy. I have hope that things are going to work out. There's a sense of confidence that brings us. But this confidence comes in the fact that God's love is being poured out in our hearts. Through the Holy Spirit, as Paul reminds us, 
being poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, when he was buried and he rose again, that was the promise that God has given us for a new life. This new life, Jesus himself even promised the Holy Spirit to each and every one of us. The Spirit would come and help us and be our teacher and be our guide. The Spirit would come and fill us with the same power that was with Jesus when he rose from the grave. And this love, this love of God that is shown to us through Jesus is now being poured into our hearts. What greater hope than that than to be loved by the one who created you, to be loved by the one who you have chosen to disobey, yet still loves. And we see this in this text. One of the most favorite verses of all the Bible that I have is the, I, the one in verse 8. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's not that we had to deserve his love. He gave it to us even while we were an enemy of God. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but how many of you really love your worst enemy? Hmm. I couldn't raise my hand. We don't love our enemies because it's very hard to do that. Those people that are against us, those people that say bad things about us, those people that undermine us, those people that just basically hate us, those people who go against us, those people who would like to see us fail at everything that we do, those people, those people. But yet God says, even while we were an enemy, even while we were an enemy, God loved us with a love that is shown in Jesus Christ. To be known that we are justified because of that love. That's an amazing blessing that we have of God's grace. That God loves you. Even though we don't deserve it. When we look at this and when we read what Paul has given us in this text. That we can, because of our justification, we can have peace. And we can have access. And we can have hope. And we can see our character growing. And we can experience God's love it also allows us to experience salvation. Since therefore we have been justified, we have salvation. In verse 9, he uses these words again, since therefore, justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God because of what Jesus has done for us. That the future wrath of God, wrath being that that God will look upon sin as it is, Sin, disobedience, unholiness, unrighteousness, those things cannot be in the presence of God. So it is God's wrath that comes upon the sinfulness. God does not hate you. God does not sit on his judgment seat and say, you are bad. He sees the sin and that's what his wrath has come for. His love is for all of us who will choose him. Through Jesus Christ, he was able to take upon the sin and take that payment for us so that we may be able to be justified and live in grace. We have to understand that it's God's grace that gives us this salvation because of what Jesus did. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8 and 19 says this, But since we belong to the day, let us, also <clears throat> let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, folks, what you and I have to understand is that as we live this life and we make choices every single day, as you make a choice every single day, and that choice hopefully will be one that will be pleasing to God, that will be understanding of who God is, will, will help in our relationship with God. Hopefully we will experience salvation. I hope that you today have done just like Christian and Tori have <clears throat> when they asked Jesus to come into their heart, realizing that they were separated from God because of their sin, knowing that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, and they accepted what he has done. I hope every single one of us will be able to have that experience of knowing that we have given our life and our heart to Jesus because of what he did. We are now justified. The very fact 
that Jesus justified us came in the testimony of what Christian and Tori were able to say to us and experiencing their boldness to come and be baptized, knowing that the baptism is not what saves, but it's what Jesus did on the cross for us. And the amazing thing that Paul gives us is when he says that we are saved from the wrath of God. It's an amazing thing because even in verse 10, it says, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more we are now reconciled. Much more we also rejoice in what God has given us. The amazing thing about the fact that he has given us more than just being justified, we now have salvation. And this leads us to our last point, reconciliation. We can experience reconciliation through the justification of what Jesus has done for us. Paul says that we have been able to receive reconciliation only because of what Jesus did, because he paid the price for our sins. Now, what Paul does in the next couple of verses in the last half of this chapter is he talks about the basis of our justification. And he talks about this using the idea of Adam, because what's the big deal about sin? In our lives, why is it that we cannot just snap our fingers and have reconciliation with God? Why is it that God created us? He created us to be able to in a relationship. So why can't we experience God? Why does sin have to come in and ruin things? Well, some of you may blame it all on Adam. Some of you may blame it on Eve. Doesn't matter. We can debate that. But the fact is, sin entered creation because of the choice to disobey God. And you and I continually deal with that because we are in the seed of Adam. Adam was first. Everybody else, including us, came afterwards. So with that, you have to realize when God created Adam, he created him in paradise. When sin came and entered, that changed everything. Not that God had to go back and made a mistake. It's that man chose. So therefore, man was not able to experience the eternal life, the long life that I believe we would have had if sin had not come. But since then, death enters creation. Since then, all these things have happened. And so we have to understand, and this is what Paul does to remind us the basis of our justification. As he talks about, and I'll just read that real quick. Therefore, just... In, starting in verse 12, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. What Paul is talking about here is saying the law helps us to see where we mess up, just like any other law or rule that we have. It helps us to know that's wrong, that's not right, that's against the law. So Paul says, without the law, we would not know how bad sin really is. But he goes on and says, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type for the one who was to come. Paul says, Adam to Moses, there was no law because the law came, the Ten Commandments, and all that God had given us to live by gave, was given to Moses. Before that, it's the understanding that they sinned just out of the nature that was passed down from Adam. Paul is saying, listen, the reason that you need to be justified, the reason that I need to be justified is because sin came in through Adam and it has stayed with us ever since. And he goes on and says in verse 15, But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many die through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of the one man's trespass, death reigned through the one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to the eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? (laughs) Some of you are thinking, what does all that mean? I'm going to sum it up. Sin entered through Adam, and we have dealt with that for all of our lives. So through the one man, sin, disobedience, and the need for justification comes. So because of God's love, he sent Jesus to die on the cross so that through the one sacrifice of the one man, we may be justified to be able to be reconciled back into the relationship that God intended for each and every one of us. That's why we need justification. That's why we need Jesus. That's why we need to understand our sin. Only through Jesus will we be able to experience the grace of God and have the peace and the hope and the access and the character and the love and the salvation and the reconciliation that only comes through Jesus. Because sin entered through Adam, justification came through Jesus. We have to understand when he talks about that death reigned, this was the cost of our sin and our disobedience that came from Adam, lives within us when we choose to disobey God. But righteousness reigned in life when we accept Jesus into our life. So to sum it up, eternal life that is given to us, as Paul talks about in verse 21, eternal life through Jesus Christ is only found in faith that we have believing in Jesus Christ, in the hope that we have in God, that through him we are reconciled, and through the love that he has shown us. You know, one of the things that we really enjoyed about the vacation was just being able to see everything. I mean, the Smoky Mountains was great. When we were able to wake up in the morning in the mountains and be able to see that fog rolling in, when we were able to drive through the National Forest, and yes, we saw bears, yes, we saw deer, yes, we saw lots of turkeys, we saw a lot of stuff, beautiful stuff. And it was hard for me to take it all in because we were constantly looking. I mean, I was driving, thankfully. Missy was taking pictures left and right. It was incredible. Oh, stop here. Stop. If I would have stopped every time that she would have, we would have had a fender bender. I would have caused major havoc in this one lane road in the national forest, all because we had to get all the pictures that we could possibly ever give. It was just too much. But then I realized, you know, it Sometimes we do that in life. We get so focused upon all the little things that happen in our life that we forget. We lose hope. We don't see the big picture. The big picture of the vacation that made it wonderful for me was just the fact that I could see all these things and know that they were all from God. That it was a beautiful thing to be able to experience. I didn't have to see every little thing that happened or every little... creature that was running around or anything like that. Luckily, we didn't see any snakes. Thank the Lord. Hallelujah. Because that would have ruined my whole vacation. But we just took in the fact of what God had made for us. Don't lose hope, but understand sin. To be justified through Jesus gives us the hope of eternal life. Knowing that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. That he died so that we may be justified. We may be made right in our relationship all through faith. Faith is belief that leads to action. You say you believe in God, but yet you live a disobedient life. That is not faith. The Bible says even the demons believe and shudder. But when we have faith, which means we act upon our faith, we have hope, we work through our suffering, we understand our salvation, we don't live in the old life, but the new life that Jesus has given us. That is faith, that is living justified, and that is the righteousness that God gives us. His grace to each and every one of us. Have you made that choice in your life today? I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to close today's service with a song. And Brandon and I are going to be down front for any one of you who would like to come and talk about a relationship with Jesus. Knowing that you've been justified. If you've never been saved, if you've never made a decision to accept what Jesus did for you. If you don't know how to do that, this is your opportunity to respond. To know that you've been justified. If you're watching us from home live streaming, you can message us. You can contact us through email. You can let us know. And we would be glad to set up a time or a phone call to visit with you some more. To be able to know that you're living justified 
through the grace that God has given us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this opportunity to be able to worship you today. And Father, I pray, God, that each and every one of us will have an understanding of the grace that you have given us through Jesus. That, Father, as we open your word, we can be reminded that it's because of justification that we are able to experience all these things. But it's not just something that we have. It is something that we live. That we live in peace. That we have access to a holy God. That we are able to live through the suffering of this world. And we have hope in the eternal life that Jesus has given us. Father, I pray for those people who are struggling, whether it's through grief, whether it's through the struggle, financial struggles, whether it's just this world, God. I pray that you allow us to know of your presence, your peace, and your love that you have given us through Jesus, only through Jesus. Father, may every day we live in Jesus. I pray for those that need to make a decision in their heart for Jesus. Maybe they've never prayed the sinner's prayer. Maybe they've never prayed to ask Jesus to come into their heart. God, I pray at this moment, in this moment, if there's someone here today or watching us and they want to ask Jesus into their heart to know that all they have to do is to do what Scripture teaches, that we acknowledge Jesus died on the cross for our sins and that we ask Him to come into our life to save us and to make us new. To confess God's love for us. And if they have faith, believe that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, and they ask them to come into their life, that, Father, they will be saved. And I pray for that person who may have prayed that for the first time in their life. I pray for those that are struggling, that they may have the boldness to be able to take a step of faith and to ask. Father, we thank you for the great testimony of baptism, knowing that Jesus died was buried and he rose again that we might have new life. God, thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing.
shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless stand before. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much for joining us for worship today. Brother Paul has something he would like to say. Oh, thank you, Bob. All right, real quick before we dismiss, I just want to say the results of the deacon vote. All three candidates, Joshua Merritt, Brian Todd, and Eddie Weaver, received well over 95% affirmation, affirmation and approval of that. And so we will be scheduling an ordination service for these three men and a wonderful opportunity for us just to be a part of that as a church family to be able to affirm that. And so congratulations to those men for the affirmation of being ordained and we will schedule that service coming uh, soon. Also, I invite you to come back next Sunday. It is going to be a very special Sunday. The deacons actually voted also back in the fall of licensing Jennifer Weaver, our children's and preschool minister, into uh, the ministry. And so next Sunday, we're going to have a special time. Uh, it's just going to be a great time. Jennifer and I are going to be up here and be able to talk together, kind of like a question and answer about children's ministry, about her call to ministry. And so you're going to want to be here for that special time as we as a church are able to affirm again what God is doing in the lives uh, of our folks by licensing her in the ministry. And we're thankful uh, for Jennifer and her ministry with us. So join us next Sunday for that. Thank you again for being here. Uh, be aware of a lot of things. There's a lot of ministry opportunities. So be in touch. Be connected any way you can. Worst case scenario, call the church office because we can help you with your questions. But it's great having you here with us. Great to have our live stream family with us as well. We hope you have a great week. We're dismissed today. Thank you.